Good morning and welcome to our Area 6 meeting. We are recording this meeting, so any of our friends and or colleagues who can't attend today um, could certainly catch up and we'll make sure we share out this recording with uh, other county partners um, if they weren't able to attend today. So we have a full agenda and we're trying a little different approach this year. Typically what we've done over the last few years is to kind of share, 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 and then we have time at the end and it always feels so rushed. So this time we're trying to do some sharing and then built-in Q&A and then sharing built-in Q&A. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with some introductions of our county partners. And I know we have supervisors and at least one county manager on today. Um, so if we can have our county board supervisors uh, introduce themselves, then we'll transition over to extension colleagues. And um, uh, Chair Bartlett, I'll have you get started. And so let's do Dunn and then we'll do uh, anyone from Chippewa County and then um, anyone from Eau Claire County. And Chair Bartlett, please uh, make sure uh, Paul gets included in that mix as well. All right, I'm uh, David Bartlett, the Dunn County Board Chair. I represent District 2 in the Northwest uh, corner of our county. Been on the county board uh, about 22 years. Um, and I don't know if there's anybody else from our county as supervisors on this. I don't see any, but maybe the maybe on the other page. Um, if not, Mr. Miller, yeah, you see you're on, so go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Paul Miller. I'm the county manager here in Dunn County. Thank you, Paul. Is there anyone on from Chippewa County? I didn't see any. Okay, and then our Eau Claire County supervisors. Um, uh, Supervisor Bates, would you like to get us started? You're muted. Here we go. Um, Colleen Bates, Supervisor, Eau Claire County. I've um, been on the extension committee for longer than the law should allow and have uh, always enjoyed it tremendously. I serve as first vice chair of the board and have other committee assignments as well, but extension has always been my star. So glad to be here today. I could go ahead next. Um, I'm Missy Christopherson. Um, this is my freshman year on the county board and um, on the extension committee and also was appointed to the fair committee. Um, so I've been serving on that since about June of last year. Uh, I am Heather DeLuca. Um, I am, uh, this is my third term on the county board in Eau Claire, and I'm from District 24 up near the airport. Great. We're so glad to have you all on with us today. Is there anybody else who's a county board supervisor or administrator that we may have missed? Okay. All right. Next, we will move uh, to extension educators. And what we're going to do this year is we do have three main presentations today. One will be an interdisciplinary uh, report from Farm Technology Days that Lisa is going to lead. And then Sandy Tarter will be sharing about the market match program in uh, two counties, hoping to grow into a third. And then uh, we will have um, some presentations from our Community Development Institute colleagues. Um, so because we only have three main uh, uh, 
presentations, we wanted to make sure that each educator had an opportunity to share out uh, at least one highlight, whether it's an accomplishment uh, that they've been a part of or something on the horizon. Um, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started and we'll introduce um, uh, county by county. And then we do have a few state colleagues that will have uh, join us as well. So, um, and uh, Brooke and Lauren, let's keep you as uh, state colleagues towards the end as well. So let's get started. We will have our Chippewa County's uh, colleagues uh, get us started and Jerry Clark wondering if you can lead us off. Name what you do and uh, an accomplishment or something on the horizon you'd like to share. Sure, thanks Catherine. Jerry Clark, I'm the agriculture agent here in Chippewa County. Uh, kind of work in the crops and soils area primarily and um, we just wrapped up our uh, some of our alternative cropping research, uh, mainly the last couple of weeks around industrial hemp. So we're trying to work on that, uh, getting that crop to be uh, on the processing side of it. So working with a number of departments at UW-Madison. And just for uh, clarification, if anybody reports me having 64 bags of industrial hemp in my garage with a fan blowing on them, it is legal. So. Excuse me. Okay, and let's popcorn um, around for our other Chippewa County folks. I can go next, Catherine. Um, so I brought, it's kind of accomplishment and it goes hand in hand and it's part on my white background, I guess. Let me flip this off, hold on. Um, because it's something that I worked on in the past year and then something that is coming up again. Um, so I brought my award that I received from the Association of 4-H Educators for the Virtual Learning Community, if you can see it in there. Um, last year, for the last year and a half, we've been learning a lot about how to program in virtual spaces in the 4-H Youth Development um, Program, and I think it, this is indicative of the teamwork um, that has gone on in, at the state level and both at the local level with working with Louisa and Rachel um, on virtual programming and reaching young people. Um, during a really challenging time in their lives and our lives too. Um, and I also am looking forward because we have our Discover 4-H program coming up, um, which starts on October 7th. And we're doing the first and last one in, in person and then the middle four online. So seeing how we can use hybrid as a model to reach young people as well. Um, and we have 37 young people signed up. We're going to extend the registration until Monday. Um, and hope to get more young people interested, whether it be in a short-term 4-H experience or a long-term program for this upcoming 4-H year. I can go next. I am Nancy, the nutrition educator in Chippewa. Oh, I see senior centers up here. Sorry, I was doing some programming um, at the senior center. Um, I'm the nutrition educator with Chippewa and Dunn County. Um, this summer, it was great to do some in-person teaching outside uh, with coordination with Margaret. We brought um, a Boys and Girls Club to the kids' community garden. Um, I did nutrition lessons, games, new lesson, tasting. They made a mural, and then we would swap them out. Margaret would do um, programming in the actual planting part. It was a lot of fun. The kids really enjoyed it. Um, the last day we ate, tasted a plant part salad and one boy, maybe 10, 11, um, he's like, oh, I didn't think I liked salads. This is really good. So that always makes your day when, when, when you hear that. And the kids are less fearful to, to try vegetables, so. Well, um, we should have coordinated, Nancy. I, I have the same uh, highlights as I, um, I'm Margaret Murphy. I'm a horticulture educator serving uh, Chippewa, Dunn, and Eau Claire counties. And I did want to highlight, too, the youth gardening that we've been doing with Boys and Girls Club. And as Nancy had mentioned, uh, we did do a 10-week program this summer that took place at the Chippewa Falls Community Garden. And it was wonderful because it provided opportunities for kids to have hands-on learning 
that promoted best practices in the garden and connects kids to the natural world. And as Nancy had mentioned with the tastings, it, it helps teach them lifelong healthy eating habits. And this program was based on the highly successful program ongoing in Eau Claire County at the North Riverfront Park. And that has had a winning partnership between FoodWise educators and Master Gardener volunteers. And gardening is an excellent way for young people to also learn lifelong skills that go beyond the garden, such as personal responsibility, commitment, and teamwork. And so the goal is to establish thriving youth gardening programs throughout Area 6. So I've also reached out to the Boys and Girls Club that meets in Menominee, and I'm hoping to do, or I am doing a couple of gardening classes with them this year and hope to expand that to a summer course as well in 2022. Thanks, Chippewa. Uh, I, I hope I didn't miss anybody, but let's go ahead and move to Don. And I'll ask for Stephanie to get us started and then we can popcorn from there. Awesome. Hello, Stephanie Hintz. I'm the Human Development and Relationships Educator in Dunn County. Um, I've had some lovely colleagues ask me in the private message what happened. And uh, unfortunately, I sprained my dominant hand. So typing with my left hand is very slow. Uh, so I opted to just not message and just tell everyone <laughs> right away. What happened is I tried to avoid getting hit by a car and I threw myself over my handlebars, which is fine. It could have totally been worse. So I'm actually super lucky that this is all that happened. Um, but I am just gonna go slower. <laughs> so please be patient with me as I'm navigating the next couple of weeks and teaching my left hand how to do things. I realized that I didn't really teach it how to do much. So, <laughs> um, okay, a, prod, a project that I really wanna highlight is our practicing the pause. So this is a statewide effort uh, that I really love because extension human development and uh, behavioral health institutes do work in these fields where we are teaching mindfulness, healthy coping mechanisms, just holistic self-care. We do that through a variety of programs. And we have heard time and time again that, you know, the, the participants all across the state that take these programs from educators all across the state, they want more, right? So they want more than just that one-off class or even our seven session classes, because the self-care practices as we're talking about it feels good in the moment while it's on our mind, we can do it, but what happens when the class is done? Well, we created a practice in the pause uh, class so people can still stay tapped into those resources, those skills and that outlet for community and practicing what we've already taught them and potentially teaching them new things. So that is a 30 minute drop in session each week on Thursday, we have been getting nothing but great positive feedback. Uh, the people that come, come back time and time again, and we're looking forward to expanding that, as well as making sure that it's as equitable and accessible for other people all over the state. So we're in the process of recording two of our sessions. So we recorded two of our sessions, and we had those um, closed captioned in English in the process of getting both of those videos ready for Spanish interpretation and translation. Uh, so yeah, it's been a really good program. And if anyone here wants to try it out, we hold it every Thursday and I'd be happy to have you guys join. Excuse me, do you access it through your own Chippewa County website or yeah, so I can actually just drop the link and then you can sign up uh, if you want to check it out. Thank you. And and we'll be sure that we send out all the links today as well. So if you don't get a chance to jot them down or save them, we will email everybody. I could go next, if that's okay. I'm Louisa Gerasimo. I'm the Dunn County 4-H educator. Happy to be here today. It was hard to choose something to talk about, so I'm going to talk about something we did once and we're going to repeat again because it was so successful. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, as Heidi said, we've come together across the whole area to offer things more broadly, um, often in a Zoom or online format and sometimes in a hybrid format. Uh, we were working on um, delivering project materials right to people so that families could do projects together at home and that was very successful. So last year I was contacted by the um, two professors from the art department at UW-Stout 
offering, um, actually they were asking to work with us because they have art educators who needed time with students to teach uh, their art lessons. And because of the pandemic, these poor art educators were not getting into schools. So we figured out um, on the fly <laughs> a very complicated program and put it into place and it was very successful called Art U. And we broke the kids out by um, grade groups and we had art educators um, separate out and teach their lesson plans, which had been vetted by the art educators at Scout. That was successful enough that the department contacted me again and we are now planning to do it again next spring, um, ideally in a hybrid format, which will include getting all of the students to UW Scout to do a gallery walk and to receive their materials and then the middle art lessons will be virtual. And then the last night is going to be a gallery walk for the students to show off their own art, which the art educators will have hung up in a sort of semi-professional way for families to see. So fingers crossed that we'll be able to do that this spring. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Wontok, Dunn County Agriculture Agent, and I've been in Dunn County for, I think, the past 11 years. A uh, project I want to highlight includes some previous accomplishments as well as something on the horizon. And uh, starting in 2019, I received uh, just about shy of a $50,000 grant to really look at taking some farm financial management curriculum and adapting it. It was about a 20-year-old curriculum that was taught in person and trying to look at some alternative uh, teaching methods. And this was pre-COVID, uh, but it worked out really well. So we've updated those fact sheets. They're on the uh, farm financial manager or the farm the farm management um, website. They are both translated from English into Spanish and Hmong. And now um, that those fact sheets are being developed into an online curriculum in UW's Canvas course, our learning management software. Uh, soon we'll be also producing videos and our goal in working with Wisconsin Department of Ag Trading Consumer Protection and utilizing some of their funding is also to translate those videos into Spanish and Hmong. So look forward to uh, that information coming soon. Thank you. All right, I will pop in here. Um, I'm skipping Sandy. So I am Michelle Bashan. I am the support specialist here in Dunn County. Um, really my talking like local accomplishments is keeping these educators supported and keeping their, um, helping them keep their things on task and on, on time. Hi, everybody. I'm Sandy Tarter, the FoodWise Coordinator for Dunn Chippa and Eau Claire Counties. And I get a full 10 minutes to talk to you a little bit more about our Market Match program later this morning. Great. Thanks so much. Let's move to Eau Claire County. And um, yeah, you're first on my screen. So why don't uh, yeah, you lead it off? And um, Christy, please do feel free to share as well. Hello, good morning, everyone. I've been having audio issues, so hopefully you can hear me. Um, so I am the Human Development and Relationships Educator serving Oak County, and I've been working on a literacy project to really help build uh, the brains of young kiddos, and we recently got a donation of about 100 books in the school district to help with a prevention education program that was created by our state team. And so the, um, the program is focused on interactive reading, and if you come into my office, you'll see there's a ton of boxes full of books I'm getting those ready to go because this weekend, um, one of the churches in Eau Claire is hosting the Mexican consulate. And so they'll have a lot of um, families there getting those to those families. And then I'll have about 50 more that will be distributing to other um, partners as well too. And then whatever is left over will probably make their way into the little libraries with some inf information about extension uh, prevention education program. And then uh, just quickly inserting too that along with literacy, uh, I think some of you are aware that I've been working on a laundromat project. And so just wanted to share that seven out of the nine laundromats in Eau Claire so far that we've contacted have um, have come back and said that they are on board. So we're moving forward with that and just looking at grants right now to um, resources. So yeah, very exciting. Yeah, will you share a little bit about what's going to happen at the laundromats? Yeah, I would love to. Um, I could go on and on too. So I'm happy to talk more um, later on if anyone wants to learn more. But uh, something that I, I always share is uh, I was a kiddo who grew up in a laundromat. That was kind of my second home. I had a big family. We didn't have um, a washer and dryer in my home for, for many, many years. And so a kiddo's on average, uh, families on average spend about, I think it's two, two and a half hours. Lisa knows the answer. <laughs> 
I can't remember Lissa, but Lissa got it right. I think it's two and a half hours each visit that they, they take to the laundromat. And so uh, that was that was an area that I wanted to focus on with a literacy coalition here. And um, what we'll, we hope to do is to be able to get a number of resources from talking and teaching into the laundromats. And those will be um, in, available in English, Spanish, and in Hmong as well too. We're working on that right now with the, the national team. And then um, the long-term goal is to then also, this is a partnership with the library. The library is a big partner in this, is to really develop um, opportunities to engage with families at laundromats during the busy times where we might actually be there programming and offering resources and services of parenting programming. Maybe it's focused on interactive reading, whatever it is. Um, so that's kind of what we're hoping we envision. And then uh, kind of along with this literacy project is also getting into some of our grocery stores as well. So that is happening at some point, we hope. I uh, will go next. My name is Rachel Hart Brinson. I'm the Forage Program Educator for Eau Claire County, and I will be highlighting a little bit of my role with Farm Tech Days in Lissa's presentation. Um, but just a quick um, highlight for me this summer was uh, programming in the Eau Claire Area School District with their um, summer school program. That was the first time that 4-H has partnered with them uh, in doing that. And I had over 100 young people in six programs that I led along with a couple of volunteers. And so that was a highlight. I look forward to building relationships with school personnel so that we can have more programming throughout the school year. Okay, I'll hop in next. Um, Lissa Seafelt. Um, I'm the agriculture educator here in Eau Claire County. You'll hear a little bit um, more from me later, but just a quick thing that's um, on the very immediate horizon for me is a, a program called Leadership Eau Claire that's sponsored by the Eau Claire Chamber, and I get to work with our local um, land conservation um, person, Greg Leonard, um, and walk about 45 participants through um, basically a day of agriculture. And um, these are participants that I normally don't work with. They're not my key farmer demographic. Um, they're folks that are not directly involved in agriculture. So I'm always really excited to work with this group um, because they are kind of sponges and just um, waiting for information. So I get to work with them next week um, on Thursday. We have our um, agriculture and environment day um, that we get them um, immersed in agriculture information. So looking forward to that. Good morning. Um, my name is Pamela Warren Armstrong, and I'm a nutrition educator here in Eau Claire County. And then we also do some programming in Dunn County. And we were programming virtually in Dunn County for their summer boys and girls club. And just a small highlight, um, we spent uh, six weeks at the North Riverfronts Garden here in Eau Claire County, and just had to change it up a little bit because of uh, COVID procedures. Uh, the kids walked to and from the garden. So they got some physical activity. Uh, it's a mile walk. So two miles round trip. Um, they never, I mean, they, they never complain. They just trucked down to the garden because they were excited to be there. And one day, uh, the highlight that I just really wanted to share is that we took a field trip to the farmer's market when we were at, uh, on Wednesdays, we were at a closer garden, the, the community garden right on the river. So we walked to the farmer's market and we did some uh, educational activities, field trip through the market, split the kids up. And on the way back, just the highlights, um, they were so excited to be there. They've never, a lot of them had never been there. They weren't, they were so excited to go home and tell their parents about the farmer's market and also share market match if, if they were on food share. And also just that they, they couldn't wait to go back. It was just kind of an eye opener for us. And so we're really hoping to um, continue that uh, next year when we do the summer garden program. I'll happen next and go off of Pamela. Good morning, everybody. I'm Joy Weisner, uh, the other nutrition educator here in Eau Claire County and also Dunn. And we just finished up a really, um, I want to say cool, because it was uh, curriculum training called Around the Table. And it's uh, for families and youth. So there's two, you can teach it with families or with youth. And it's all about um, putting together, you know, trauma-informed engagement with nourishment. So really 
trying to help teens and families make healthy connections with food, with themselves and with community or within the community. So we were really excited about this new curriculum and hopefully we'll get to try that out this year. The other thing on the horizon um, that we're really excited about is hopefully teaching in person this year in Head Start classrooms, first grade, third grade and fifth grade uh, in Eau Claire and Dunn counties. Yeah and also in Augusta in Eau Claire County. So hopefully we'll get to do it in person. If not, we're ready to go for virtual. So thanks. I guess I, I can go. <laughs> um, so I'm Addison Bang. I just started last month. So uh, I'm going on 40 days right now. Um, I am the new um, community development educator here um, with a, my focus will be on community food systems and um, broadband. So I don't, right now, I don't really have any programming per se. Um, I've been kind of getting introduced to a few different programs um, that is going on throughout the, the state. Um, but the, the one that I would say I'm most excited about um, and I'm still learning about is a statewide program uh, I can't remember exactly what the name is because it's kind of long, but I want to say I, th I think it's expanding capacity to support Hmong farmers. And so they just recently completed a assessment last year um, and the assessment, you know, kind of uh, looked at a couple different or the outcome um, kind of looked at a couple different issues that um, Hmong farmers are dealing with. And so they're looking at possible like, um, you know, um, Succession, what that might look like, um, looking at land access, um, looking at alternative markets. Um, nothing is really set in stone yet. Um, I think the the this, the next phase is to kind of kind of look at what the program might look like. Um, so um, I'm looking forward to getting more involved with that and kind of seeing um, you know where where it goes and what the next steps are. Uh, but oh yeah, besides that, you know, a lot of what I've been doing is just um, you know, um, getting more familiar with all the different counties, um, doing a lot of outreach, um, you know, meeting with a lot of educators, getting a lot of advices. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just really a lot of, um, you know, getting myself uh, ingrained into um, these three, three counties. So, so I'm in three counties, <laughs> Dunn, Chippewa, and Eau Claire. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it's just a lot of, um, you know, reaching out and, and learning about each counties and um, um, trying to figure out who who next I can uh, connect with. Um, but that's that's all I have. I think I might be the last one for Eau Claire. I apologize, I can't turn my camera on. I am getting a new laptop soon and hopefully that will fix my computer issues. So you just get to look at my picture today. Um, I've been with Extension for about four and a half years. Like Michelle said, my main responsibility is to make sure that everyone else's day goes well. I also have been spending quite a bit of time um, updating our Facebook page to make sure that we can help get the name out there and that people know about Extension so we're not the best kept secret. Thanks so much, Christy, and to all of our county-based or multi-county-based educator team. Um, before we move to some of our state colleagues who are here, I'd like to take an opportunity for our CRTC committee chair, uh, Supervisor Anderson, and our um, vice chair on our extension committee, Supervisor Jansen, to please introduce themselves. Um, you can just say hello, your name, where you serve, and then we'll transition back to staff uh, introductions. Well, sure, Catherine, I am I up or who's up? You are, go for it. Uh, thank you. Um, I apologize for being a little late this morning. Everybody has some things that unexpected come up, so I am a little late. Um, if you notice the background I have, I don't live at the Mabel Tainer Theater in Menominee. <clears throat> I just thought it was nicer background than my Stark office. So <laughs> that, uh, that's the Mabel Tainer Theater here in Menominee. I, <clears throat> I am uh, chairman of the Community Resources and Tourism Committee on the Dunn County Board. 
and and I'm that's the committee I enjoy, and I thank Chairman Bartlett for appointing me to this because <clears throat> with my background and working with Extension, I'm able to work with Catherine Emanuel, you every month, and uh, and all of our our Extension educators, many of you whom work in. Chippewa, Eau Claire, as well as Dunn County. So <clears throat> that's my role. And uh, what I wanna share with you today uh, briefly is that <clears throat> uh, with, with the changes and what's going on, what, what really impresses me is, is how current and up-to-date and, and bringing all the resources of our great university right here to Dunn County. <clears throat> and. Um, and as recently as Addison Bank came on, uh, who used to work here in Dunn County and the land and water, uh, excuse me, in the planning and zoning area. And when he left, he left a vacant uh, spot with us. And now we're glad to see that Addison's back. We had a committee meeting uh, on Monday of this week and Addison was the uh, extension educator specialist that came and talked to us. So. Uh, that's what is important here in Dunn County is that not only my committee of five people, uh, but then it's our job and our role to bring it back to all the other county board supervisors. And um, so Colleen Bates, good to see you again, my friend. Um, it's been a long time and uh, we've known each other quite a few years. Uh, and I look around and of course I know uh, Jerry Clark and uh, Chippewa County and, my, and all of you from Dunn County. And those of you that share county here coming to <clears throat> Dunn County, I haven't gotten to know you as well as I should yet. And much of that, I suppose we could blame to COVID, uh, but I do look forward to meeting you face to face. And uh, to Catherine Emanuel, who is always uh, available and works so closely with us, uh, I can reach out. Of course, I read every day about Catherine Emanuel in the Eau Claire paper. <laughs> You're a busy woman. <laughs> Congratulations, as all of you are. So anyway, thank you for hosting this meeting. I think it was uh, important for all of us in our three counties to stay together and communicate together. And uh, I look forward to when we can do it face to face. And finally, Colleen, are you going down to La Crosse to the Wisconsin Counties Association meeting? You're not. Well, we've had a lot of them drop out of Dunn County too. So I think it'll be a small conference. Uh, thank you, Catherine. That's the end of my report. Looks like Supervisor Bates was sharing she will be there uh, in La Crosse. So you'll see her there. All right, uh, Supervisor Jansen, take it away. Hello, everybody. Thank you. I apologize for being a little bit late as well. Um, when I'm not serving on the Eau Claire County Board, I work for Royal Credit Union as their program director of community relations. And I was on a, a meeting related to that hat that I wear and that ran a little bit late. So I apologize for, for being a little bit late. Um, a little bit about myself. I am Eau Claire native, born and raised, proud UWEC Blue Gold graduate. And it's uh, my honor to represent the north side of Eau Claire where I've spent almost my entire life. Uh, I have been on the UW Extension Committee. This is my second term uh, with the County Board and I have been honored to serve on the, ex uh, the Extension Education Committee um, for that whole time of service that I've been there. And um, my first introduction to the work that Extension does was actually through um, what Joy and Pamela were just sharing about. Before I came to Royal, I worked for the Boys and Girls Club and got to know them very well and, and they got to see that fantastic Kids Garden partnership um, in action. So that was kind of my first, first dip into the um, extension world, but since joining this committee, my eyes have just been open to all of the fantastic work that extension does. And what I think makes extension so special is, is this that we have right here, the fact that extension brings people from all over, all different backgrounds together, and just to help to support and grow our community. And so it's an honor to, to serve on this committee and to hear all of the amazing work that you are doing in your community. So thank you. And thank you for organizing this event, Catherine. Yeah, thank you so much. Appreciate that. So uh, we have, uh, I think, four colleagues online with us this morning who are from the state, and I'll have them introduce our, themselves. Let's go, Brooke, Lauren, Lindsay, Matthew. 
Sounds good. Hi, everyone. My name is Brooke Berg, and I serve as the Outreach Program Manager for all of the family engagement and relationship programs that happen across the state of Wisconsin. And um, I'm located here in the Eau Claire County office. So thank you to Eau Claire County for letting me keep this as my home as I transitioned into a state role. Um, I wanted to just briefly share something that's on the horizon in family engagement and relationship programs. And that is that we will be having our first ever Raising Wisconsin Children's Parenting Conference in January. So we will be doing a virtual conference that will take place on a weekday evening and then on a Saturday morning. And we will be having lots of different speakers, uh, keynote speakers from the university and outside of uh, the university. And we will also be featuring our own Yia Lore as a breakout session presenter for that as well. So that's something that is exciting and will serve the entire state and beyond. Well, thanks for having me. Good afternoon. My name is Lauren Larson. I'm a forestry educator for the Natural Resources Institute. Um, I work out of the Eau Claire County office as well, but I cover approximately 25 counties in the northwestern part of the state. Uh, something that I'm excited about that just happened this summer and is going to be expanded on later this year and next summer is a women woodland owners program where we connect women woodland owners with resources and professionals to help them uh, sustainably manage their forests. Um, we've learned that more women are coming to own forest and ag properties uh, within the state and nationwide. So we are doing our best to be the first to target this audience and show how awesome extension can be in connecting landowners with uh, resources to help them manage their properties. So thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, I'm Lindsay Day Farnsworth, Community Food Systems Program Manager with Extension and I'm Madison based and um, I'll be sharing a little bit more about our program in a couple minutes here. So I'll hand it off to the last um, state uh, colleague to introduce themselves. Hi everyone, I'm Matthew Call. I'm the Director of Communications and Stakeholder Engagement here at Madison. Um, and I'll share uh, to the conversation that James and Colleen were having. I will be at the WCA conference um, in La Crosse. So stop by our extension booth and say hi, I'll meet you in person. Thank you everyone for those lovely introductions. It's really nice to hear what um, my colleagues are doing across the county and the state. So it's a good reminder um, of the amazing work we're doing. So uh, speaking of amazing work, we are ready to have Lissa Seafelt talk about Farm Tech Days. Okay, and everybody's going to have to tell me when my computer switches over to the presentation mode if it's got the actual slide up or if it's the presenter screen that you're seeing. It I'm looks getting awesome. Up from Rachel, it's the right one. Awesome. Um, so thank you everybody for being here today. I uh, really appreciate it. And just wanted to share a little bit about this, this tiny little event that we had <laughs> recently this summer um, here in Eau Claire County called Farm Technology Days. And we're going to talk a little bit about the um, teaching and capacity building that does happen at Farm Technology Days. Um, so on this slide, if you can see in the background, um, I've actually got a picture of um, Julia Nunez, who is our current um, Alice in Dairyland. She's actually serving um, a second term because of COVID. So um, we were really fortunate to have her um, join us at Farm Technology Days. And she is actually a local to the area. For those of you that might not know, she is based out of Chippewa County. Um, so we've um, been lucky to have her and um, have her at our events. Um, so Farm Technology Days um, is, is kind of a, a big thing that takes a lot, a lot, a lot of planning. Um, there's a lot of events that happen. It's a three-day show, and this uh, year happened to be hosted at Hunsinger Farms um, in Eau Claire. And um, for those of you that might not know, um, Hunsinger Farms is known for their horseradish farm, which is um, shown on this picture that was on the official program. Um, so that was something that's unique. We've never hosted Farm Technology Days at a horseradish farm before. So that was pretty exciting. Um, for those of you that maybe haven't experienced the Farm Technology Days, it is literally a 
three-day show that pops up in a farm field of alfalfa. Um, and so as you can see from the two pictures here, um, it is a rather large event. Um, we're talking acres of space. Um, you can kind of see the scale based on what we have uh, on this main picture here, which has uh, vehicles on the setup day. And, and just to kind of give you a scale of what this looks like, um, what you're seeing on this picture is uh, kind of focused in on Innovation Square, where you see that uh, kind of several lines intersecting the blue striped tent there. So that was Innovation Square featuring some of the um, fantastic uh, businesses that we have in the Chippewa Valley area. Um, so people uh, got to see a lot and learn about some different aspects of air culture that they maybe haven't um, gotten to see before, uh, including the horseradish, some kidney beans, um, some aquaponics, and who am I missing? Oh, um, the uh, some apple orchard um, and a cheese making um, company was featured in Innovation Square. So got to see some kind of neat things there. Um, and just a couple more pictures that um, my uh, predecessor in this role uh, in uh, the egg position here in Extension in Eau Claire County um, had shared with me who um, was largely, largely involved with Farm Technology Days. Um, he had shared some pictures here just to kind of see the scale of um, what it looked like on day one, including the parking areas. So just to kind of give you a little bit of perspective of what that looks like, um, because we don't always get to see these pictures. So um, wanted to share that. Um, when we're talking about what we actually saw for participation, we had some excellent, excellent numbers at Farm Technology Days. Um, this is a agriculture show for farmers, um, but we also get some community members showing up as well. And over the course of three days, uh, there was a uh, over 52,000 people that attended. Um, this number isn't accounting for those um, that were under 12. Um, they're pretty hard to account for when they're not ticketed. So um, that is probably a, a fairly conservative estimate of um, the number of people that went through. Um, to run this show, it takes over 1,500 volunteers because there are so many things um, to be done. And that is something that is very unique about this show. Um, and especially with uh, Roots um, with Extension um, originally running this show. Uh, and we have since kind of shifted out to a very much sticking to an educational mode. Um, it takes a lot of volunteers to make this show happen. And it really pulls the community together um, to make this show uh, happen. And it's a, a long planning process as well. Um, it takes over three years of planning um, to make a show happen. And we had over 520 exhibitors across 26 states that exhibited. And we had uh, 16 buses that were shuttling um, almost 4,000 people on the farm tour. So just some really great um, turnout this year. Could not have asked for better. Had some great weather um, to go with that. So uh, that was really exciting to see. Um, I mentioned it takes a lot of planning to make um, this event happen, and I'm going to really focus in a lot on our agriculture um, area, which is highlighted by this um, star at the top of the map here, but this is just kind of a layout, a footprint of what um, the Farm Technology Days was that you saw those pictures um, earlier in the presentation. And for those of you that don't know, uh, Mr. Mark Hagedorn is featured at the top left here. Um, so very integral in the uh, planning process. I will mention, um, I stepped into my role here in uh, Eau Claire at December of 2019. And um, I'm gonna mention uh, Jerry Clark and Katie Wontok um, were kind of our leads on the um, education committee um, planning process. So they were already in the thick of things when I came on board. Um, so just wanna give them a shout out because they have put in a, a lot of effort and it takes a lot of planning to make um, our little section happen as well. So we had a great setup. Um, we had a great location right next to the uh, where the farm tours were leaving. And this is just a little bit closer look at, at one of our plans. Um, of where we were putting our different areas within our space. So we have uh, different focuses um, in agriculture. Jerry had mentioned that he focuses a little bit more on crops and soils. Katie focuses a little bit more on farm management. And I focus a little bit more on dairy and livestock production. So um, we have several different areas that we're covering and that we're kind of highlighting in our space um, at Farm Technology Days. And then we also um, had some outdoor um, 
planting areas that had different um, crops and, and maybe Jerry will hop in and give us a little bit um, more detail when we get to a, a slide. He can cover the things that I might be forgetting, but just to kind of give everybody a idea of how this was laid out and what this planning process looks like on paper. And then we take that um, and convert it over. Um, I mentioned that we have a lot of planning that goes into this. Um, when we had um, done a conservative estimate of folks that were walking through our area, um, we figured we ended up with about 4,500 people that walked through our area, were interacting um, with all of our different booth spaces, um, a lot of prep time that went into this, um, over 320 hours that included our prep, our planning, and then our teaching um, actually at Farm Technology Days. Um, one thing I'll mention when you um, when we're hosting Farm Technology Days uh, at a location, um, we get a lot of different help from folks, and I'll highlight some of that as we go through the rest of this presentation. But um, you know, due to some COVID restrictions, we maybe didn't have as um, normal of a participation from some of our um, educators or specialists because just um, travel restrictions and things like that. So, um, but despite that, we still had some great turnout. We had 15 different agriculture educators that came and helped with our space. We had uh, nine master gardener volunteers, and then we also had a showing from um, the 4-H program and the forestry and natural resources area. So we really appreciate everyone's help there. Um, as I mentioned, we were located near the farm tour area, and this was just a uh, short line for one of the farm tours early in the morning one day, um, but we were right next door, which uh, worked really great for traffic flow for us. Um, when we're starting to set up our space, we basically get an open um, piece of alfalfa covered ground and you build from there. So um, in a quote unquote normal year, we may have had a large tent this year um, because of COVID. Uh, we definitely had little pop-up canopies that we set up all over the place so that everybody had shade. Um, and we also had set up a uh, goat area that you'll hear a little bit more about in a second, but it takes, um, you basically go from a blank slate to a um, area and you'll see a couple more pictures in just a second here. So we had our pop-up canopies um, set up. This is kind of a, a large picture view of what that looks like and um, from the, the streets of this bottom picture you can see that is the street that was running parallel with Mitchell Road um, just to kind of give you a perspective of how big our area was on the right hand side of this picture you can see some of the different crops that were planted um, and on the left hand side, you can see the little goat set up. Um, so really want to thank everybody for their efforts because it does take a village to run this show and even our little section of the show. Um, one of the interesting things that we did this year to kind of help bring people into the area as they were coming off of the farm tours was um, this gravity box hoops. Really want to thank Jerry for bringing that idea and uh, making this happen um, because the noise of one or two people just throwing a couple of basketballs really kind of brought some interest and pulled people into the area. So rather than you know, just cruising on by, they kind of were like, oh, what's that? And then after they um, did a round or two of hoops, then they came and visited with all of our um, booths and um, got to talk with us about our various um, setups that we had, whether it's talking with farm management about some um, HR management um, activities, or if it was um, viewing some of the cover crops, there was a great pull from this. So really appreciate um, that being here um, at Farm Tech Days. That was a great thing. Um, in the crops and soils area, um, we also had uh, a little prototype that Carl Dooley had brought in. Carl Dooley is the uh, ag agent in Buffalo County. Um, he can be seen in the top left here um, with his intern. And um, he brought this uh, hemp processing prototype for extracting the fiber. And, and Jerry, if you want to hop in, if you got some more details on that, um, this might be a great place to do it. But um, that was kind of a neat thing that we got to feature and, and talk with a few folks about. Um, and then we also had our forage um, specialist, Joanna Newman, um, who had come in with some different um, forage plants and some information related to grazing um, and had some great conversations with uh, folks as they were coming through. So, Jerry, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to this. 
Uh, no, no, not a lot, Lissa. I think um, it was developed by the, um, again, in partnership with the biological systems engineering students uh, with one of our specialists uh, through UW-Madison. So again, just uh, exemplifies that, uh, that relationship that you can build with the state specialists and the connection and being able to bring uh, resources. We forget there's students there that can build these things for us. And if we, uh, the timing's right, they were able to build it. It's a prototype, uh, definitely needs some more safety features on it and things like that, but it does, it does work. And um, they're doing some modifications as we speak. I'll also just chime in as long as I got the microphone quick. Lissa, if you look back at those gravity box uh, wagons, you have a very talented uh, artist and painter on your hands here in Lissa. She did probably 80% of the paintings on the side of that wagon. So with her and uh, Caitlin Davis in La Crosse County, uh, that's how that's who did all the paintings. So appreciate uh, you got a very talented painter in Eau Claire County. Artist, I should say. Thanks, Jerry. Um, yeah, so and and to to make this area happen, um, you can see the different educators that that we were able to bring in and and kind of help with their expertise and background. Um, you know, through the course of the three days, um, we had Carl Dooley, Jerry, of course, um, Steve Akinick out of Trepolo and Jackson, um, Kevin Chesso with uh, Burnett, Sawyer, and Washburn County. So really appreciate everybody um, taking the time and bringing their expertise um, to the county. Um, farm management, we had a, a little bit lighter crew, but they had a really great interactive um, game. You can see they have that little spinner board there and they were asking some trivia questions related to um, human resource management. Um, so really want to give a shout out to um, Katie Wontock in Dunn County, Caitlin Lance out of La Crosse, and Heather Schlesser um, out of Marathon County. And Katie, if you had anything to add, feel free to jump in. No, um, we utilize the same concept on a prior farm technology days. And uh, so it's great to kind of update material and engage people and educate them at the same time. Thanks, Katie. Um, and then we had our dairy and livestock station. Um, so last year we had developed, um, we being uh, all of our uh, colleagues across the state that work in the dairy area um, had developed a series of, uh, I think it was 12 or 13 fact sheets on um, heat stress and dairy and different um, ways to manage that. Um, and so you can see I'm holding up a little QR code that is connecting folks to that information. And we also had a display board where people could kind of uh, answer some questions to win a prize um, that related to the heat stress in dairy animals. Um, so that's what we had on the dairy side. And on the livestock side, we had these great little cardboard cutouts um, that had a poster on, um, you know, developing the different um, cuts of meat as, as people are working on direct marketing, um, what things they need to be thinking about, dressing percentages, all that kind of info. Um, and we had um, QR codes to try to keep things neat and tidy and accessible for folks. Um, so you can see the cardboard cutouts to kind of draw people in um, to the posters there and get connected to that information there. We did have several educators that came to help us, so we really appreciate that. Ashley Olson out of Vernon County, um, Heather Schlesser out of Marathon, Matt Lippert um, in Clark and Wood County, Ryan Sterry out of St. Croix, and Standy Stitchin out of Taylor County, so really appreciate everybody's efforts there. My computer is being a little bit slow. Bear with me a second. There we go. Um, and then also to help um, bring people in and um, get them seeing different parts of air culture that they might not see otherwise, um, we did um, have the uh, good luck and fortune of having some connections with um, some goat farmers. And uh, we were able to uh, work with Jason Benson out of Limet Farms in Albertville um, in Chippewa County. Um, who happens to have some connections in the Chippewa office as well, but um, brought a handful of goats um, for us and um, we got them set up. You can see the top left, we had a, a fenced in area for them and um, Jerry was gracious enough to leave some alfalfa for them <laughs> as we we're setting things up. Um, we had some grazing for them and they enjoyed the alfalfa there, but got to um, do several uh, goat milking demonstrations. Um, Jason had uh, borrowed a portable milking unit um, from a friend and, and this milking stand so that um, folks could uh, come by at certain times of the day 
uh, to see him uh, milking the goat and answer some questions about that process and, and what goat farming looks like. So um, we're really happy to have um, had that opportunity to show off some different parts of agriculture that people might not normally see. Um, and this is just one of those pictures that shows one of the milking times and we had a few folks um, kind of checking things out and learning from Jason what was going on um, with his goat milking. We also had a fantastic uh, master gardener and horticulture area. Um, I, you know, shout out to uh, Margaret Murphy and the master gardeners that that helped um, with this area because uh, there was a lot of folks going through there, had a lot of visitors answering or asking questions. Um, visitors got some educational materials as they walked through. Um, they had uh, approximately 115 fact sheets that got distributed on lots of different um, topics that that were of interest to folks, kind of timely seasonal things. Um, the volunteers had done a, a nice job of putting together several different displays on the um, top right there. You can see a picture, I believe, of the weed garden um, in containers. So just some of the common weeds that folks are encountering. Um, the middle picture on the right is a picture of a couple of the master gardener volunteers that were helping um, staff the booth. And then the main picture on this page and the bottom right are a couple of different um, container garden displays. One is uh, a succulent garden and the other one I think was demonstrating the use of a wine bottle to help with managing watering capacity. So just some really neat things there and really appreciated um, having the, the master gardener and horticulture area um, was a great display. Um, and then we also had a couple of other um, areas that had uh, brought some information to Farm Technology Days. Um, Lauren Larson, our regional uh, forestry educator, was there and had been asking the question, do you know your county forester? And a lot of folks that went through did this um, voting activity on the top left. They had little rounds cut of branches where they could vote. Did they know their county forester or not? Um, it looked like there was quite a few no's there and Lauren was able to connect some folks to their uh, local forester. It looks like 97 um, landowners got connected through that conversation, which is just you know great to see that we got some folks connected um, to learn a little bit more about forestry and uh, woods management. Also 24 signed up for ease newsletters and 46 um, brochures for the learn about your land forestry class um, was taken. So that's uh, great to see as well. And then I'm going to pass this off to Rachel. Hello, I hope you can hear me. I've been keeping my uh, video off because sometimes the bandwidth is not so great with all of us on Zoom. So um, Youth and Career Discovery Zone, uh, we were very intentional about that name. You would not believe how many iterations of youth and career and activities um, went through in the planning process because we wanted it to sound fun and we also wanted it to um, appeal to older youth and maybe older youth's parents so that they would come because this was very much a partnership between CVTC, UW-Eau Claire, and, uh, and 4-H. And so um, we wanted them to experience fun things and also think about uh, activities and career opportunities in, uh, in Egg. So it was over two years of planning. Uh, we, of course, had COVID thrown in. And so we were going to outreach heavily to the school districts and get school groups to come. And we basically scrapped that. We did very little outreach, to, direct marketing outreach to FFA chapters and to school groups asking them to bring buses. Some FFA chapters did come uh, and that was great to see them there, uh, but we decided instead of doing that outreach that we would create educational video tours. I see I am slowing down, so I'm going to turn off my video and see if that helps. Um, so educational video tours were created of the, fa of the farms that were highlighted uh, many of the farms. So there was a Ferguson Orchard tour, there was a Chippewa Valley Bean tour, uh, Nellie Holstein's video, 
Oh gosh, I'm going to forget somebody. I'm sorry if I forgot you, but there were, I believe there were five different videos that were produced um, by CVTC. And then they hired an ag teacher uh, to create educational um, curriculum to go along with those. And those are housed on a separate website and they will live on. And everyone who I talked to who viewed the videos said, those are awesome. They're great videos. And they are, They're, they are, were um, really well um, produced and they were really interesting. So though that's sort of a legacy project that is going to last uh, after the, this program happened. And that is pretty cool. Over 10, we were hoping for 1,500 people to pass through our zone in three days, and we had over 10,000 people. We printed 3,000 of these. Um, here, I'm going to turn off my turn off my background so you can see. This is our passport experience um, that we had, and that. Um, that was uh, really fun. So we would tell people do eight of the 13 activities and come to the 4-H booth at the end and write a thank you card to a farmer and fill out those thank you cards. And then I got to hand them free Culver's custard scoop coupons. It was it was a pretty good deal um, for us <laughs> and we were really busy. So I want to thank, you can see the picture in the bottom there. I had, my, I had two of our three interns for the summer that we had through a public health partnership. Um, Carly and Liz helped me all three days and you can see Frank Ginther there on the left. Uh, Frank is now retired as the Pierce County 4-H educator and he is a wonderful human being and came two of the three days to help in our um, education zone. And it was wonderful to have them there. I also had activities for young people to do. We had beaded bracelets and we I had a display about 4-H uh, projects and how you start with something simple and then you can build it up into something bigger and more complicated um, with some smaller uh, beaded loom uh, displays on the back there. I had 4-H information. We also had, you can see in the background of the picture of the four of us working there, um, there's some bikes and there's a quilt hanging up. Uh, we were given some items to raffle. Uh, actually, I shouldn't call it a raffle, to put in for a drawing. So we had some items that we could have people sign up and, and win prizes just for signing up. And that was kind of fun to do that too. Can you go to the next slide, please, Lissa? So these are some examples of the postcards that were written. Thank you for being a farmer. Give your cows a hug from me, from Caleb in Eau Claire. Um, and I have this other one. Oh, you can't quite see it on the shared screen, but that the Dear Farmers, You Are So Helpful Because You Make Fruits and Veggies That Make Us Healthy uh, is from someone from Hawaii. So we had some, some uh, long distance travelers who came to our through our space and that was great. Um, so we mailed those postcards that had addresses. So some people said, how are you gonna get the addresses? And I said, if you know a farmer, you can put their address down. So we had some people send their, um, or put the address of their grandpa or their dad or their uncle. And we mailed those yesterday. And those were, there were 129 of those postcards. And I delivered the others to Adam Whaling at CVTC to be distributed uh, to events where farmers will be in attendance and they will be given out. So that was pretty, that was pretty fun. And I am, um, I was really, I really wanted to make sure that especially the ones that had addresses on them got in the mail. So that is now checked off the list and, um, and farmers should be getting them within the next week. Uh, and the sort of wrap up big picture for me anyway, as part of this is when I came on, 
planning had already started, you know, two and a half years ago when I started this position. And it really has helped build relationships between UW Eau Claire, where I already had some contacts, but also with CBTC. And so I have already been, I've been having some com communication about partnerships with 4-H and educational experiences that could happen with CBTC and partnerships, and that would not have happened without this relationship building um, over the last two years. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so to, to kind of wrap us up, I do want to mention to um, and give just a little shout out to our, our land conservation um, group here because um, Greg and the no-till drill um, that was at Farm Technology Days um, made the front page of the newspaper. Um, so that was super great um, to hear. Um, and that program kind of just got started this year. So just really uh, great to see that it has been having some really good success um, for those that might not be familiar, uh, Eau Claire County uh, was able to purchase a um, no-till drill, and that's been getting rented out to farmers um, for them to be able to test out some um, no-till farming practices um, without having to commit to the equipment but have access to it. So that was great. Um, as Greg and I were talking a little bit there, um, we heard of at least one farm that had purchased a drill after having rented this one. Um, just kind of shows you the, the success, you know, within, you know, basically having used it um, one time, somebody saw the value of it and decided to make that leap and actually um, go ahead and purchase it because it was uh, useful to them. So that was really great to hear. Um, so Wanda share that. Um, there may be others that I have not mentioned um, in this presentation. I know we had a lot of help. Um, so if I have not mentioned your name, I'm so sorry. Let me know. But uh, lots of people helped at this show. Really appreciate all that help, including our um, support staff in the office here, Chrissy Peterson, Andy, um, and also Catherine. Catherine was doing some farm tours. Um, so I think um, that, was, that was a fun um, little excursion for her one day. So really appreciate all of the help and support. And also those of you that were at the WEXA booth, thank you, thank you, thank you for being there and supporting us and um, helping um, just get you know, that information out there about what extension is and does. We really appreciate you being there and supporting us. Um, really appreciate that. Um, one thing that does come out of this is that um, there are local scholarships that are available for students that helped with the show. Um, and so you can see the criteria up here, but some of that um, money that's brought in by this show does indeed get returned back to the county. Um, so just wanted to mention that that's kind of a nice little bonus um, for the county as well. And if you happen to miss the fun and want to experience this yourself, it's actually going to be nearby next year um, in Clark County. Um, so you can um, check that out uh, as well if you're interested. That's going to be July 12th through the 14th of 2022. And with that, if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out and ask. Um, we've got several of the educators uh, that were um, helping with Farm Technology Days that are on today. So feel free to ask us some questions. Thank you so much, Lissa, and to the entire team for all of your work there and also to the Extension Committee in Eau Claire County who has been helping to lead the efforts to bring Farm Technology Days into the county for five plus years, I think. Um, so thank you for your work there. I think we'd have time for a question or two and um, would certainly open up the floor to um, any of our uh, county partners would have a priority for asking questions, but if none there, then certainly our extension staff. So feel free to just unmic yourself if you have any questions or comments. Uh, Colleen Bates. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, first of all, I really want to thank the individuals that work in all of the offices throughout this area, uh, all of our educators for doing this literally uh, on their own initiative. Uh, there isn't anything that really shows how dedicated uh, that you are to the work that, that you do when you go over and above to show the public 
what your important work is about. So I can't begin to tell you, uh, the, we put up the WEXA uh, display and Jerry, thanks for the help with the pop-up, taking it up, taking it down, hauling the chairs, putting our nice posters up and down. Uh, it was, it was a, a pleasure. And I'm very, very proud of the work that everyone did uh, in this whole process. Can't help but think how unfortunate it would have been had we not been there. 50 some thousand people, up close and personal extension. So when it happens over in Clark County, I hope we can do something similar. Thanks. Go for it, Heather. Uh, yeah, I don't understand how um, I get my screen to share, but um, so I, I did want to say, yes, everything. I was there all three days along with um, Greg Lanner's team at the no-till drill, and then I helped out in the afternoons with the WEXA. Um, lots of opportunities to talk to people. Um, glad we had really nice weather. Um, and uh, I, I guess I was um, asked, wanting to ask, um, I know all the time that was put in um, for our show, what is the part of, how do our uh, Farm Technology Day people who have now experienced setting up and planning and so forth, how do they connect with Clark County and are they, um, is Clark County reaching out to them for advice and assistance? Great question, Supervisor DeLuca. Um, that is something that happens. Um, so um, what happens is that the, the kind of previous year that is hosting is definitely um, working kind of hand in hand with the, the next coming year after it for the planning to help transfer some of that knowledge so that it's not lost from year to year um, to kind of smooth some bumps in the road. There's always going to be potential issues um, for just little things that you don't think of. Um, but yes, there, there has been conversations between um, this past year's um, planning group and then next year for Clark, they have been um, getting those interactions started and there will be ongoing conversations that do happen as um, Clark really gets into their, um, you know, kind of nose to the grind, if you, grindstone, if you will, of, of getting the, the final planning done um, because it, it once you hit that you know, one year out, you really start to, to go into high gear when it comes to the planning process. So there'll be ongoing conversations um, as we go into the fall and uh, winter here uh, as they're kind of going through their final setup plans. Did that answer your question? Did I, do you need more detail than that? <laughs> uh, no, um, I was just wondering, I thought there was probably a process. I just didn't realize what it was, you know, and, and because, um, uh, with COVID and everything, the education uh, committee kind of was more removed from our process, you know, and stuff. So, um, you know, with things being less in person and so forth. Um, my other question was, have they chosen a farm or is that what they do in the first year? Oh, yeah, the, the farming location has been selected already. Yep. Um, I believe that's uh, rail acres. I believe they're out of loyal. Yeah, that's usually decided pretty early on in the process. The county will, um, you know, put in their bid that they want to host and then there'll be another process um, that kind of goes through and solicits uh, basically bids from farmers that are interested in hosting. Um, and then from those bids that are submitted, um, there will be a um, selection process that occurs to, to kind of um, pick the site that might be most suitable because um, 
certain years can be a challenge depending on how weather plays out. So most years there happens to be a rain event. And so um, selecting sites that are kind of on high ground is kind of a priority for um, farm technology days to try to prevent any um, cancellation of our uh, of the three days that would occur. Um, so that's uh, something that places a lot of emphasis on in that selection process. And then once that farm um, is picked or sometimes a partnership of a couple of farms together, um, then the planning kind of proceeds from there. Um, and, and uh, you know, then those committees start to be formed. Um, the, the board is, is formed, of course. And then from there, committees will start their um, work and planning process, get connected with the um, prior year's committees, um, so sometimes it's not the entire um, volunteer force that is connecting with the next entire volunteer force. Oftentimes it is a committee connecting to the last year's committee, kind of more one-on-one -on -one asking very specific questions, if that makes sense. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm just looking at time and we are, um, we had a break scheduled just maybe by show of hands or nods, or are you all okay if we just keep moving forward? And if you need to take a break, you certainly could at any time. You okay to keep moving forward? Yep. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll pass it to you. All right, so to continue with our, our meeting here, I will be introducing Sandy Carter. Um, she is our food vice coordinator, um, serving Chippewa John and Oak Park counties. And so she will be talking about of growing food security and our really excellent market match program as well too. So welcome Sandy to us. All right, thank you. I am going to share a screen here, to talk about food security with our market match program. So it is a challenge because all of our three counties are at a different stage of experience and understanding about the market match program or the EBT sales at the farmer's market. So let me go through just some basics. Of course, SNAP is a federal supplemental nutrition assistance program. Here in Wisconsin, SNAP is called food share. So those two terms are interchangeable here. EBT is electronic benefits transfer. So in Wisconsin, the EBT card is called the Quest card. So those food share benefits are downloaded to the Quest, the card each month, and our food share users can use that to swipe and, and make purchases. So Today's, um, we will, I will focus more on uh, Eau Claire and Menominee because they have the EBT token sales and the market match in, in our, in their, in our cities here. We also accept the food share card from other states at our markets. And we also accept the pandemic EBT card, which is benefits given to families that are qualified for the free and reduced lunch um, program. So why is this so important regarding food security? Because of the uptick, of course, in food share participants in our counties. So as you see here, Eau Claire, we are now at 6,574 households, and you see the recipients. This is an increase of 1,819 households since pre-pandemic, since 2019. In Chippewa, we're up to 3,630 families that receive food share. That's an increase of 1,078 households. And in Dunn County, we're up to 2,495 households or families, and that's an increase of 736 families since 2019. So note that 39% of all these total recipients are minors, and the average Wisconsin monthly SNAP benefit is $247 per month. So at FoodWise, you know that we're a community nutrition education to specifically low-income families. We offer Strong Bodies, which is a strength training program, also in corporate nutrition education. And we can focus a small percentage of our, our time in the area of policy systems and environmental work in these four focus areas. So one of them is EBT at the farmer's market. So what are the benefits of SNAP EBT? It is, so of course, access to fresh local foods in hopes that we have increased 
fruit and vegetable consumption. We're supporting farmers, which infuses money into our economy. And we can use these farmers markets as a location for nutrition education. Like you heard Pamela mention, and also uh, Nancy did do several education opportunities at our markets this past summer. Here's the market match structure. It's a one for one match. So for every SNAP or food share dollar purchase, we will match that with one dollar or one token up to $10 per week. It is the duration of the market systems. Um, so in Eau Claire, it's June to September. And in Menominee, it, they started in May and go through September. So the market is, the managers are um, taking data collections daily, they're purchasing tokens, they're renting the machines, and then uh, we tee up to secure matching dollar funds to give it that market bonus, that double bucks. Here's a picture of Eau Claire, someone purchasing tokens. So in Eau Claire, we have two tokens. We have the food share tokens and we have tokens for debit credit purchasers. All vendors in both markets, Menominee and Eau Claire, all vendors accept those tokens. And you see the lower left corner, there's a picture of the Menominee market. Each vendor has a sign notifying people, yes, we do accept tokens. In Menominee, it's just the one food share participant token. Tokens can only purchase the produce and food. So of course they cannot use tokens for like food trucks or coffee, smoothies and non-food items, um, rugs, flowers, et cetera. So there are many partnerships that have been built to create, to enable this market match program to start. Let me focus on Menominee first. This is the first year. It's so exciting that we are able to offer the market match program. So I work closely with Veronica, the market manager. Westcap is the overarching agency that runs the program. Health Done Right is the coalition that received funding from the Community Foundation and that was divided to the action teams. I'm on the chronic disease prevention action team. And so I called up Westcap and they said, okay, now's our chance. We're gonna, we're gonna try to get some monies. So we sent a proposal. We were allocated $1,600 for market match. So we started in May and by the end of June, that $1,600 was gone. Thankfully, the community foundation sent directly to the farmer's market another $1,500 for market match and that was used up July and August. And so our chronic disease prevention team, we reallocated another $400 to be spent for market match. And as of yesterday, that's gone. So we've had a total of $3,500 in the match alone. The EBT, so those food share sales were 5,942 this year at the Menominee market. That is over double, almost triple what it was last year. In Eau Claire, let's talk about this. So the EBT or food share token sales started in 2012. The match component started in 2015. Lots of people are involved to make this happen. I work very closely again with Deidre, the market manager. We have Nancy Coffey, who is the past Foodwise coordinator, one of the original founders of this program. She still helps with the surveys. And in fact, this weekend, she's doing a tour with one of our corporate funders. UW-Eau Claire professor Eric Jamelski and his research students have been so valuable. They um, staff the sales table from July through September. He gathers all the data. They also do the partner, the evaluation surveys given to the, to the participants. Eau Claire City Council has um, allocated us some funding to help with our, our needs of purchases for the market match program. Uh, we have Kate Beaton, who still is an organizing, she was an organizing member of this program, but she still helps with the website. Our extension families are instrumental in helping with that sales table as well. Jonah, we asked volunteers to help distribute our marketing materials, Feed My People, they, they accept corporate donations. And then we also put in our marketing into their weekend food kits. And then I work um, closely with Eau Claire County Support and Wisconsin Department of Human Services. And in the past few years, we've sent home a mailer to each Eau Claire food share household telling them about the market. They ran out of money last year. And then Professor Jamelski, he came up with over 4,000 uh, 4, research dollars to do that mailing this year and to fund some incentives. And then we have our sponsors. So last year with that uptick in demand, we, we actually ran out of money. And so we went on a campaign to really see who can help support this program. 
And Group Health Cooperative has been a large supporter ever since the beginning of 2015. New this year is Northwestern Bank and HSHS Sacred Heart as donators, um, funders. And then we have a local software company who's donated since the beginning. Uh, of course, City of Eau Claire, as I mentioned. Excel Energy is a new sponsor this year. And then we have one community member that donated. So the I don't have the numbers for 2021. Of course, it's still going until the end of September. But in 2020, we had $33,218 just in the food share purchases and that match component. Our participants, they're not just buying the $10 to get the free $10. In fact, they average out to spend about almost $21 per visit. And this year we've had, um, or 2020, we'd had 529 unique food share participants. So a little data here, as you can see this, the blue bar shows the number of patrons and the orange is the visit. So if you see 2017, 18, 2019, we had a stable um, number of in the 430s. And then we took that jump almost by 100 in 2020. And we see that they visit about two to three times per year. And here are the purchases. So the blue bar are the food share purchases and the orange bar is the match component. So at the very end in 2020, you see that we had a, a big jump, 18,281 in the food share purchases and then that match of near $15,000. So we had always been at about 10 to 11,000 in previous years. So of course we ran out of money. Thankfully the market was able to kind of float that. So we didn't turn anybody away, but that's why we went on that campaign this this winter to garner more support. So with those evaluation surveys, we have found out the following that 95% reported eating more fruits and vegetables. Yay, that was our goal, right? We had 70% say they saved money on produce. We had 66% say they found it easier to purchase fruits and vegetables. 61% said they are trying new fruits and vegetables. I ran out of room, but 66% also said they, they tried a, a bigger variety of colors of vegetables, which is important for nutrition. And 52% say they buy all of their weekly fruits and vegetables there at the market, utilizing the market match program. So does this improve food security? Absolutely. So we asked the questions on our survey. Are you, are you worried about running out of, out of food? And do you run out of food at the end of the month during the year that the market is not there? And then during the months of the market. And so 66% said, yes, they are running out of food at the end of the month when the market's not in session. And so during the months of June through September, 68% reported they rarely run out of money to buy the food they need each month. So we are increasing uh, food security. We get lots and lots of great feedback. Um, people saying all the time, without this program, I couldn't, I don't have enough um, to supply my fruits and vegetables. And, you know, that additional $10 a week is so beneficial. As you see here, this person is saying they no longer need to worry that their card is running out of money. So with this program, um, that hasn't happened. So definitely a great program. That's it. So I really thank you for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks so much, Sandy. Yes, I think we'll have time maybe for one question. <laughs> and um, thank and Sandy, that's amazing work. I mean, this is a great example of the capacity building partnerships, collaboration, um, and the meaningful impact for people in our communities. Um, certainly open it up to uh, anyone who has a question. And I see Heather, you have a question. Um, yes, um, I actually am part of a neighborhood association up here on the north side. And I was wondering, you know, we've done some um, Feed My People food drives and we get, you know, quite a large donation from our area. When you reach out for sponsors or people to assist, have you thought about reaching out to the currently listed neighborhood associations in Eau Claire to then blast out to their neighborhoods um, to share information about in need of donations? Because... Um, mm -hmm. I hadn't heard anything about that, that you were looking for monetary donations. Um, and I would have sent that out to my group. 
thank you for that. That's great information. And we didn't do that this year, but I think we, we may need to in years coming because we were able to get those corporate sponsors. But I think it's a great um, opportunity for individuals to you know take part in their local uh, communities. And so, yeah, that's a great idea. We will uh, definitely bring it to the team. Thank, thank you. you. Hmm. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> We're going to go ahead and transition to our last speaker, and then um, we'll try to build in um, some uh, conversation time as well. So I am going to introduce Gail Hike. Um, she is actually our statewide community broadband specialist. And Gail is going to be working very closely with Addison Vang, um, who you all know is our new community development educator. And so I'll introduce you to Gail and then um, we'll uh, have Addison share very briefly and then we'll, he will introduce Lindsay who's gonna be really helping to share out the Community Development Institute framework for community food systems. And um, right now in Extension Community Development, we have um, about four different areas that um, are available for community development focus. We don't necessarily have a broadband uh, educator role unless it's a specialist like Gail is. Um, however, we do know that is a very important need in our three counties. And so um, Addison will be working on that just a little bit. Um, with that, I would like to turn it over to Gail and Michelle, if I can call on you to um, uh, pull up the slide there that might help as a nice visual as well. Um, so, Gail, I don't see you on my screen, but um, go ahead and un <laughs> un uh, oh, there, I see you now. Second you page. Great. Yeah, go for it. All right. Well, thanks for the invite. Um, as Catherine said, I'm Gail Hike. I work with broadband across the state with UW Extension. I've actually been with Extension now for 37 years. Um, I started out in family living and then worked there for 15 years, then moved to community development in Price County in Northern Wisconsin. And for the last six years, I've been working in broadband. And um, my role has been to work on both adoption and access. Um, I'm currently serving on the governor's task force for broadband. Um, and there we, we've been talking about what I always say, the, the three-legged stool, um, broadband looks at access, adoption, and affordability. And those are some of the issues that we address as we work with within um, broadband. Um, when you look at the, the little graphic on the, the screen, community economic development is where broadband is housed right now um, in the Community Development Institute under that, but what we're finding, um, and as we work through the pandemic, I always say uh, broadband is a topic that crosses all the program areas, right? Um, we may be working in community economic development uh, because a lot of times that's where the funding comes through. Those are the folks who have access to funding are the economic development groups and the local government groups. But we know, and as we've seen through pandemic, it reaches across all the different areas. Right now, I'm working with a group with uh, the program managers and community um, from the Community Development Institute with uh, the leadership program, the local government program and economic development program to see how we might better execute um, broadband programming across the state and so we're working together on that. I have a number of exciting things that I think are coming up. We'll be working on a survey that's gonna go across program areas, um, two different institutes looking at who's working in broadband related areas, whether it's access, adoption, or, or um, affordability, and see what some of those resources and where folks need help, and also working at doing some sharing one of the exciting things I think we have coming up will be a broadband summit. We're working on the agenda right now and hope to have that um, by the end of um, 
fall here. And we'll be sending out a um, notice of that. We're working on who our speakers might be in our topics. But we intend to cover a lot of the things that recommendations that were in the governor's task force. We'll be looking on sessions on how do we do data collection, mapping, um, looking at policy and legislation. We're taking a look at how do you build those community networks and funding opportunities. So stay tuned for that. Um, met with Addison, glad to have him aboard and looking at how we might work together. Um, my past experience with your three counties, I know you have some broadband work happening right now. In fact, I was just looking at the report this morning on the applications for American Rescue Plan Act funds and your region um, had 12 applications in Dunn County, seven in Chippewa, and one from Eau Claire. So we know you have some networks and folks working out there. Um, we're excited about it. I'm here to work with, with Addison, any of your faculty, any, any of your staff, and answer questions. Um, about some of the resources and what we might be able to do to support you. Thanks, Gail. And Addison, I'll pass the baton to you. Yes, so um, right now with, with broadband, um, a lot of what I'm doing is, you know, just reaching out um, to all the different counties, um, trying to figure out, you know, like what's kind of going on in each one, just understanding, um, you know, where each county is at. Um, yeah, so that's really what I've, I've been doing, um, learning, you know, uh, <laughs> connecting with, with Gail and everyone else that I could think of, educators that are working on, on broadband and just, uh, you know, just kind of getting a lay of the land, you know, locally and kind of across uh, the state with um in regards to to broadband and then um, you know from that you know we'll create a, um, a needs assessment and you know eventually um, some plan of work around broadband um, but right now yeah i'm just kind of um learning trying to figure out where where we're all at um and um yeah so that's kind of where i'm at with with broadband um and like what gail said you know <laughs> we didn't need so uh we're definitely going to be staying in contact um, with, with broadband and um, see where, where we go from there. Um, and I guess with, with that, I will um, introduce Lindsay Dave Farnsworth uh, or reintroduce her. Um, she's been with Extension since 2019 by way of the UW Madison Center for Integrated agricultural systems. Uh, she's an active member of several Madison uh, committees, uh, including the Food Policy Council the, and um, the Healthy Retail um, Access Program. She has an education um, from UW-Madison, um, a doctoral degree in environmental studies and master's uh, of science uh, in urban and regional planning. Um, and then she also has a uh, Bachelor's of Arts from Brandeis University. Um, and again, her, her title is Community Food Systems Outreach Program Manager, and she will go um, more into detail on kind of um, community food systems and how that fits into, um, you know, the Community Development Institute and Extension. Um, and with that, I guess I will pass it on to Lindsay. Super, thank you, Addison. And thanks again, Catherine, for inviting me today. It's great to see some familiar faces from um, Addison's hiring committee. And I look forward to connecting with everyone in person eventually one day. Let me just get uh, my slides up on the screen here. Is that showing okay for everybody? Great. Um, so 
a bit of context before I get started. Um, the Community Food Systems Program is actually one of the newest programs at Extension. It was born out of a cross-program area team back in 2011, and it only became an official program um, following the reorg. So I was brought on in late 2019 to begin shaping the myriad of food systems programming activities into a more cohesive and strategic suite of activities here at Extension. And so, you know, in many ways, we're still sort of in the early days of the program, even though um, there's a long legacy of this work at Extension. Um, so what do we mean when we're talking about community food systems? I, I wanted to put this definition on the, the slide here just because it is accepted in the field. And I think that it can kind of help um, get everybody on the same page in this conversation. So community food system is one that integrates culturally responsive food production, processing, distribution, consumption, and disposal to enhance the environmental, economic, social, and nutritional health of a particular place. Um, there's a lot packed into this definition. I think that there are a couple of key ideas here. Um, one is scale, that in the community food systems program, we're working with smaller scale um, growers, entrepreneurs, and supply chains in general. It's place-based, so the challenges and opportunities that are um, available to community uh, food systems folks up in Ashland or in Brown County are going to be distinct from those um, in the Chippewa Valley, and I think that's one of the reasons why there's so much value in having educators that are on the ground in different parts of this, the state um, can, and that can really sort of tailor the resources that we have at the state level to the needs and opportunities um, in, in their individual um, regions of the state. And then it's important to note that being based at um, the Community Development Institute, we specifically bring a community development lens to this work. So we're focusing on economic, cultural, policy, and planning dimensions of the food system rather than food production as they, at the, as they do at the Ag Institute or rather than um, nutrition, education, and, and food access um, as they do at FoodWise. Now that's not to say that we aren't connected um, to work in those spaces. And I'm grateful to have good relationships with program managers um, in, in other um, program areas and institutes. So you, you can see here just some of the other programs that I'm regularly in touch with, seeking opportunities to you know, share good work um, or collaborate as needed so that we're minimizing duplication um, and hopefully adding value to each other's work. I think one great example of this um, is that the presentation that Sandy just highlighted is gonna be showcased um, in part as part of a series that we're co-hosting with the local government education program um, next month. So you know, lots of opportunities um, to lift up each other's work. Um, but I, I also wanted to just spend a couple of minutes talking about what this work looks like on the ground, right? So community food systems in some ways is, is a bit aspirational. Um, it's not, not necessarily how the food system um, looks as we experience it. So what does programming in this space look like? Right now, um, we're organizing our programming into four priority areas. Um, they're reflected in the Community Food Systems 2021 and um, 2022 program plan, and they're food sovereignty and food justice, food systems policy and planning, food systems sustainability and resilience, and food entrepreneurship and local market development. And I want to just spend a couple minutes um, giving an example or two of, uh, in each of these areas. Um, and then, you know, if there's any time left, I'm happy to take some, some questions. Um, so our food sovereignty work right now is primarily work in collaboration with the tribes. I would say um, we have educators either based at or working closely with um, Red Cliff and um, Bad River, as well as Menominee. Jennifer Gothier at Menominee Nations doing some really cool integrated work um, around uh, health and wellness, uh, cultural and language reclamation and food systems. Um, this involves seed saving and um, reintroducing foods that were important historically to the Menominee people and figuring out how to increase capacity at Menominee Nation to grow more of the food um, that, that folks there eat. So that's um, you know, broadly food sovereignty, but in, in those particular examples, really indigenous food sovereignty work. Um, we also lump our com community and market gardens work into food justice, um, in part just because land access is really so critical for folks to um, 
to produce food for home consumption if they don't have adequate space or safe space at home to produce it. And for our market gardeners who are maybe not growing a ton of food, but selling it through marketing channels such as farmers markets, um, you know, and if they don't have land access, those opportunities are really just off the table. And so right now we're doing some evaluation work with partners in Milwaukee County to understand the impacts of just having that access um, to affordable land, either for you know, self-provisioning at the household or, or community level or um, those market gardening opportunities. Um, our food systems policy and planning activities involve the, the two webinars um, that I mentioned in partnership with the local government education program. These are focused on, on um, elected officials and um, local uh, city and county planners just to introduce some food system policy planning concepts and opportunities. Um, you know, food systems planning really uh, started to gain traction uh, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, but it looks so different in some of the big cities where some of the better um, case studies of food systems planning are. And so I think our work in, in Wisconsin is making sure that we're able to translate the value of some of what's been learned in the field already to a wide range of contexts, whether that's some of the smaller cities or, um, or, or county level planning as well. Um, another uh, project that we're working on in the food systems policy and planning space is we have a contract with a municipality and we're doing an evaluation of their healthy retail access program. We're really excited about that because part of the contract means developing evaluation tools that other cities can use to evaluate healthy retail initiatives in their communities. We're um, focusing on two, two different stores. One's among grocery store and another is um, a Dominican or, or Latinx grocery store. And so all of the evaluation materials are being translated into um, Hmong and Spanish and they'll be available on our program website um, for, for partners and, um, and educators across the state. Um, our food system sustainability and resilience work is primarily reflected in a multi-state project that, um, that we're a part of that's looking at disruptions to food supply chains um, as a result of the COVID pandemic and really trying to understand what are ways that we can strengthen our local and regional supply chains so that we don't have those types of disruptions, whether from natural disasters in the future or from um, you know, health related uh, catastrophes such as, as the pandemic. Um, probably many of you saw the headlines last year of both you know, bare shelves and also um, bottlenecks in, in some of our meat supply chains in particular. And so we're learning, we're um, learning, uh, you know, how different food entrepreneurs um, and businesses navigated that in different three different regions of the country, the South East, the Southwest and the upper Midwest um, in partnership with some colleagues at University of Minnesota. And we're going to be doing statewide and, and nationwide um, webinars with some fact sheets um, as well going out the next year. And then um, last, but but certainly not least, is this food entrepreneurship and local market development space. And honestly, when you know when I'm thinking about maybe where the opportunities lie in the Chippewa Valley, this is sort of the first priority area that comes to mind, both because of conversations that I had with Joseph Malwell before um, he left, as well as Catherine and and um, and Addison more recently. And you know, one of the things that really excited me about Addison's presentation when he was applying for the job was his. Um, discussion of opportunities to build market development opportunities for Hmong producers. And, you know, again, he mentioned a statewide project that's really looking at how we can build uh, extension capacity to better serve Hmong growers, which frankly has not been a strong suit of the division in the past. And I look forward to um, finding ways that that Addison in particular can continue to speak into and strengthen um, our capacity in that area. Um, food entrepreneurship also looks like building um, small scale food enterprises, whether those are catering businesses that are based in shared space, uh, shared um, use kitchens or um, you know, food trucks, uh, which are becoming increasingly popular you know, in different parts of the state. So um, this has been a real priority for our program in the last year. It's based on some research that's shown that business ownership serves as a really important vehicle um, for wealth creation, especially among members of economically disadvantaged communities. And so um, we've really had a, a strong push to, to offer more um, programming year round for um, small scale food startups. In many cases, businesses that are too small or, or too um, in, in the early stages of development such that they're not even really ready to go to the, the SBDCs for, for support. 
Um, and we're also partnering with, with Wibic um, and other um, small business and micro enterprise support services across the state to make sure that we're reaching um, non-English dominant audiences who are also sometimes bypassed by some of the existing resources. Um, so last year we had over 150 individuals attend a, a virtual statewide summit. Um, we had some, um, some guidance in response to COVID on um, operating uh, food carts safely um, that, that reached over 350 entrepreneurs. And um, I, again, you know, had a good turnout for four um, web-based trainings on food safety and regulations, both in English and Spanish. So um, these are just, this is just a taste of what we've achieved um, so far and very much looking forward to input both from community um, county partners and leadership as well as educators like um, Addison as, as the program continues to grow and evolve. And um, these are, this is just a map of some of the hot spots of, of community food systems work in our state with, of course, the yellow um, representing the good work happening in, in your neck of the woods. I'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Lindsay. I really appreciate that. And Addison, thank you for the introduction. I think it's really exciting to see um, kind of the the future of what's possible and um, how this work um, really is interconnected to all of our work yet um, has the ability to kind of propel our extension services into additional um, spaces and uh, it, within our communities in the three counties. Um, I know we are just a hint over time, so we want to be respectful of folks' time, but wondering if, if anybody um, has a question that they wanted to ask or had a comment, um, especially if you haven't had a chance to share yet and if you wish to do so. Jim Anderson, are you looking to share? No, but oh, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm going to be able to have to get a hold of Gail in a little while and talk to her. Thank yep. you. Thank you, Catherine. Absolutely. All right. Well, I want to um, thank you. And Rachel's going to uh, close us up for the day. So to and you, my, my thank you will also be short, but it really it means a lot to us as staff in extension to have you um, take the time out of your day to come and hear what we are doing. We really appreciate it. We thank the state staff that helped present and share information and support what we are doing here. And so thank you very much. And if you have any questions, we are all welcome. We, we welcome the questions. So please contact us directly if you have ideas or suggestions for partnerships or programming. And uh, we really appreciate your time, both today and every day that you do your work uh, to support Extension. Thank you. Thank you.